This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. In the aftermath of fiducia supplicants, we've seen Francis deny what his own document says, that the document explicitly says that the blessings of that document that are authorized by that document are to be given to the couples for their relationship. It says it multiple times in the document. Francis recently denied that on camera in an interview in the last few days. But we've seen in the aftermath of the release of this document are blessings of these couples in parishes, cathedrals, um, and other church environments, often by priests wearing their full clericals and their, including their full mass attire. We've seen this and the Pope splainers of the world defend it, saying that uh, either that these priests aren't actually doing what the document says when they plainly are, or they are violating the spirit of the document and the bishop should crack down on them. And then what happens? Most of the time, the bishop does not do anything. There was one case of this that is the exception to this rule that was amazingly in Chicago, where this went viral online, and then the and then Supich, Cardinal Supich, apparently had a quiet talk with him behind the scenes because the uh, priest apologized for what he did. But there has been unleashed on the church with fiducia supplicants a spirit of revolution. It's a spirit of the spirit of revolution has been here in the church for sixty years, but it's as if it that spirit of revolution had gotten some kind of energy boost or something. It took on a whole new life. And we're seeing this in this unfortunate story for you today. I can't read to you this headline from Info Vaticana, but it's up on the screen for you. Because, and the reason I can't even read that is because we're talking about um, the most, one of the most favored types of people in the culture today. If you dare say a negative thing, or a negative even sounding thing, you dare to level any kind of criticism, you are a truly bad person and your presence in the world will be in the online world anyway, will be removed as quickly as possible. But yes, a priest has decided to tell the whole world about this past relationship of his and his inclinations. But this priest is even better, doing better than even merely public, going public with his past sinful life whose activities cried out to heaven for justice. This priest is one who called for the resignation or expulsion of Archbishop Cordelione over that story where he barred Pelosi from receiving the Eucharist two years ago. You remember that story? Made waves worldwide in the Catholic news and even the secular news. Remember how all the usual subjects denounced Archbishop Cordelione of San Francisco and his brave actions, actions that put him really in the hot seat with Rome. And do you remember how afterwards Archbishop Cordelione publicly proclaimed his loyalty to Francis by loudly embracing some of Francis's weird policies at that time. I remember that. I reported on it to you here. Yeah, this priest was part of the problem. He was one who called for his expulsion or resignation from the episcopate. Now this priest is openly and publicly rebelling against God. So from that article, quote, Father Aidan McKellian is one more example of how many seminaries look the other way before applying the guidelines that Ratzinger set when he was prefect of the doctrine of the faith regarding the non-admission of the seminary and congregation of people with deep-rooted James Martin inclinations. This priest, known in the United States for his heterodox postulates and for having publicly asked the Pope to dismiss conservative bishops in the U.S., assures that he has spoken to everyone he has had to confess his inclinations to. He even acknowledged that he had an 11-year relationship of a James Martin variety before becoming a priest. And mostly, quote, This article doesn't actually do this story justice. If you want real details from this, you have to go to friendly sources to this priest, and you will find none friendlier than Outreach Catholic. See, Outreach is an organization that James Martin, Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church, is a key figure in. They are one of the new ministries for the James Martin activism. The changing of the church teaching on a certain sin that cries out to heaven for justice, according to sacred scripture, according to inerrant sacred scripture. 
And they reported on this a couple of weeks ago, and this finally started making the rounds out in the regular Catholic media. And their headline is, I'm a Catholic priest. When I announced my status as a James Martin type, my parishioners applauded. Of course they applauded. Especially when you hear what kind of parish this priest runs, of course they applauded. I'll remind you what I've said reportedly, and I re repeatedly, and I reported on this a few weeks ago. New data from Pew Research, as well as new data from CARA, which is a, a Catholic research organization, shows that the vast majority of Catholics in the United States do not agree with the official church teachings on a whole host of issues, including the James Martin issue. The typical Pew sitting Catholic who goes to Mass on a regular basis, does not agree with the church's teaching on these things. Now look, I don't want to know the inclinations of any priest, personally. Most priests know this. They don't share whatever their type of, type of woman they're interested in is. They don't do it. They actually, I would assume, the fact to use the word interested in is probably not even accurate anymore. Yes, they are, you know, men with who are in good health and would have all the usual kinds of things that go with that, but they are smart enough not to share what their, we'll say, their tastes are, right? They don't do that because they're priests. They act like priests. But those who conform to the James Martin life within the church often want to share. And I have some basic questions about, are they keeping to their vows at that point? Are they clerical vows? Are they? Very big question about that. Many of them we know don't. Does this one? I don't know. I'm not going to suggest that he isn't. But if he's going to share this stuff with the world, maybe he should share that. But why are they so, so forward with pushing and letting you know wh how, what, what their inclinations are? Why do they tell you this? It's because they are all too often diabolically driven agents of Satan and revolution. Unwitting tools in his war to, to destroy the church from within. This is absolutely part of the infiltration thesis. Go back to, to Bella Dodd in School of Darkness, her book, and then a book by someone who called themselves AA23, uh, I think it was. She was the, uh, the another person, a Marie Carey, I believe it was the, with the pen name of this person. Another person who came forward and said that in the 1930s to the 1960s, they placed a lot of men in the priesthood who were not fit to be in the priesthood. And they did it on purpose to try to destroy the church. And they both had radical conversion experiences later. But their purpose was to place men in the church who should not be there, who would either work to change the church from within to make it more acceptable to them, or they would try to destroy the church. And they explicitly admitted to choosing men like this priest with these kinds of inclinations. The purpose is to destroy the Catholic Church. So why would this priest want everyone to know, including his, his parishioner, parishioners, to know about his, we'll say, tastes? Why did he feel the need to share that with us? From the article, quote, In June 2005, as I laid on the floor of St. Patrick's Church during my ordination to the priesthood in Bainbridge, a town in Northern Ireland, I knew that deep down in every fiber of my being, I was called to serve as a priest. In that sacred space, I had been baptized, received my first communion, served as an altar boy, run the youth group, and participated in the funerals for family members. It was not simply a part of me that was being ordained. It was my whole existence. Life came full circle when I was privileged to come celebrate my first Mass at Christ the King Parish in the Diocese of Oakland, California. At that Mass, I told the congregation I had just been invited by the Chancery to participate in an accent reduction class. I also told the parishioners that I would not be going to the class, and I was perfectly happy with my Irish accent. When they cheered loudly, I knew I was home. Over my 20 years of ministry, I have made a point to schedule an appointment with each of the four men who served as my bishops to tell them my story. Each bishop in his own way would ask the same question, Why are you telling me this? My reply was the same, Because I don't want you making decisions about my life as a priest in the diocese based on any one aspect of who I am. I told them that I was a person with the James Martin inclinations who, before joining the priesthood, had been in, the in an 11-year relationship. I needed them to understand my whole story. I needed them to see and hear me. My brother priest in my support group thought I was crazy. But there was some part of me that didn't care, and I knew deep down it was important to be honest and open." End quote. 
You notice that the reasoning was focused on me, me, my, my, me, me. Did you notice that? It's a form of narcissism. And we tend to see that with uh, in that though in that crowd who are very proud of their inclinations. Bear this all in mind as we approach the month of June, by the way, because it's all going to be up in our face this year, although many are, are predicting that we're going to have a much more muted version of it this year than in years past. We shall see. We shall see on that. But in that article, the priest then goes on to tell everyone that his parish is primarily African-American, which is totally fine, but then he says that his parish is mostly focused on political activism, which is not fine, but is also not surprising. Those those who are embody the spirit of revolution will have politics as their first religion. That is what they will do. Their god is the political process. And that's what we're seeing here. But it's not surprising that his parish has also become a hotbed of James Martin-style activism as well, by his own admission later in that article. Perhaps we should call it, frankly, an openly synodal parish church, one that truly embraces synodality. This priest is the face of the synodal church that they keep talking about in Rome. And that would be a much more honest way of describing his parish. But note something that he told his bishops. Every single one of them, whether they were the ordinary or presumably even the auxiliary bishops, and they all failed him. He should not be in the priesthood. His public ministry is a scandal to the church. And I say that because if he had turned his back on those inclinations and done extraordinary things to become like any other priest, and he didn't tell everybody about all the, his past, we wouldn't be talking about this in a video today, would we? We wouldn't be discussing this because he would be just another priest who had given up, who had left the old man behind and given it and fully embraced his role as a priest in the order of Melchizedek forever. But that's not how this works. The revolution in the church requires that they be upfront with this because they want to change the church's teaching on literally everything. And so they need a face for it. And this priest is your face for it. Let me know what you think of all this in the comments, please. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So does sharing this on social media. That helps too. If you've ever thought about supporting the work of Return to Tradition through Patreon or Subscribestar, now is a great time to do so. Links are in the description box below. They help keep these daily messages coming. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.